Thanks. Uh, so I'll start sharing the screen as well. Here. Let me know if it doesn't work. I think it should. Um, so welcome to the IIIF and MAPS um, uh, session. Uh, my name is Virginia Pallero. I'm one of the uh, um, MAPS community group co-chairs together with Elliot Jordan and with Steve Maples. So um, I hope that you're enjoying the, um, the conference so far and maybe you have been following the um, maps track uh, with the, uh, the presentation from Jules Hulman and Bert Span on all maps. And now recently the one that just finished uh, hosted by, by Martin on geospatial data and IIIF. And if you're still curious, tomorrow there is one, uh, one short talk on the lightning talks by Brian. So be sure to check it out. Um, but now let's take a step back and hear a bit about the history of the um, maps uh, group from, from Stace. Let me just double check that I'm sharing audio. We'll stop sharing and then start it again because I'm not sure I did it. This happens, doesn't it? I have to check every time, yeah. Yep. Okay. I wasn't. So it's good that I'm doing it again. Let's see. Hi, and welcome to the IIIF and MAPS community session. I'm Stace Maples from the Stanford Geospatial Center and co-chair of the IIIF MAPS group. Before we get started, I'd like to take a few moments to highlight some of the historical milestones that have led up to the IIIF MAPS group and some of the work that we're currently doing. Almost as soon as the internet was born and there were browsers available to browse the web, map libraries were scanning high resolution images of maps and making them available for download online. For the most part, these were just scans made available to download and they were very large for the download speeds of the time. Some of them taking an hour or more to download a single map scan. So when we started my website, uh, Julie Sweet Kind Singer and myself in, in 99, we took a lot of heat because our files were too big. Fast forward to 1999 when davidrumsey.com first launched. One of David Rumsey's great innovations was the Luna Image Browser, which allowed very high resolution scans of maps to be made available online through a browser, while also providing with deep zoomable capabilities at performance levels that were unheard of at the time. Another one of David Rumsey's early innovations was to work with Google Maps and the API to lay geo-referenced scan maps on top of Google Maps and make them zoomable within their geographic context. A company called GeoGarage, together we built the system of using the Mercator projection. It's a little strange. Everything had to be in Mercator uh, because of Google Maps. Um, but we pretty much launched that, I guess, right when Google Maps itself uh, launched. Even using Google Maps mashups with simple dots representing the locations of maps from the David Rumsey map collection at that time was an incredibly innovative use. Fast forward again to 2011, when the New York Public Library established the NYPL Labs. A couple of projects of note came out of the NYPL Labs, not the least of which were the Map Warper, the first web native georeferencing infrastructure for scanned maps. Another early innovation of the NYPL labs was the building inspector, which used a combination of computer vision and human intervention to digitize the building footprints from Sanborn fire insurance maps. It also allowed for quality control annotations and other types of augmentation of these scanned maps. Fast forwarding again to 2014 and again at the New York Public Library, moving historic geodata to the web. This was a meeting of a virtual who's who uh, of anyone who was working with maps and spatial data in the gallery, libraries, archives, and museum space. This meeting was basically uh, a meeting to review the state of the art in moving geospatial historical data to web access. 
everyone who was there was engaged in trying to figure out how to integrate infrastructure for historic geodata on the web. Some of the projects that came out of or benefited strongly from this meeting included early IIIF, the Open Geo Metadata GitHub community, early efforts at creating Geo Blacklight, and many other sessions focused on bringing historical geodata to scholars across the web. In 2016, we hosted the first geo for live camp at Stanford University. geo for live camp is an annual meeting of GIS librarians and associated technologists who are focused on bringing historical and modern geospatial data to the web. In 2020, at the annual geo for live camp meeting, we held an after camp meeting. This was the first meeting of IIIF and MAPS community. Over the course of the past year, we've been hammering out what it is we want to do, writing recipes, and creating some prototypes for some of the things we think IIIF should be able to do. You'll get a lot more detail on what we've been up to over the last year in the coming session. So enjoy the rest of the session. Welcome to IIIF Maps. If you're interested in joining us, please check in to uh, joining the community, check the IIIF community calendar and drop in on either our technical sessions or our community group sessions. Thanks. Great. So now I will stop, stop sharing and pass it on to Elliot, uh, who will tell us more about the, uh, the general mission and the resources on the group. Hi there. Um, as Virginia mentioned, my name is Elliot, Elliot Jordan, and I'm gonna talk about the mission of IIIF Maps and present some resources for finding more information about our work. Uh, the IIIF Maps community currently has two separate but related groups the parent community group and a technical specification group. The community group is, as it sounds, a community focused uh, group with demonstrations and topics of general interest to the wider geospatial and IIIF communities. The primary mission of the group, according to our charter, is to explore best practices for associating geographic information with IIIF materials. So as an example, here on the right, you'll see a map of the palace and gardens of Versailles that are overlaid with place markers that link out to IIIF enabled content related to that particular location. So the MAPS community group has three co-chairs, uh, Virginia, who you just met, uh, Stace Maples from Stanford University, who you also just met, and myself from Princeton University Libraries. The community group has a number of specific goals under the general umbrella of the primary mission. So the first goal is to develop a method for using IIIF with geolocated images and also to create a collection of recipes. So the recipe you see here on the slide represent canvas fragment as a geographic area in the web mapping client uh, was created with input from our community members and what is, is one of our early entries into the IIIF cookbook. So a second goal is to explore interoperability between IIIF and other geospatial standards. Uh, some examples might include interoperability with a tiled map service or TMS, with Open Geospatial Consortium or OGC services, such as web map service, web feature service, and the new generation of OGC feature and maps APIs. A third goal is to investigate a JSON-based schema that could be used to represent an image in a geographic space through the use of a IIIF extension. An example of this is the NavPlace extension, still under development, and which we'll talk about in uh, a bit more depth later on in the session. Another goal is to develop methods for transforming annotations from an image coordinate space to a geo-coordinate space. So the example that you see here is a web annotation placed at a geographic coordinate, in addition to uh, a web map and some uh, place markers there too. So you'll see more of this in the rerun demo a little bit later on as well. So in order to support and implement the use cases formulated by the community group, 
we chartered a technical specification group. The chairs for the TSG include Bert Spahn, an independent software developer who you might have seen in the session earlier, Michael Appleby from Yale University, as well as our IIIF editor representative, Brian Haberberger from St. Louis University, and myself again. So the primary mission of the TSG is to add geo support to version three of the IIIF presentation API by extending the existing specification. So at the outset, uh, we decided on two deliverables to start with. And we definitely envision more as we work through some of the uh, initial use cases and as we move, move forward. So the first deliverable is about making spatial context a primary property of IIIF resources. The deliverable itself will define an interoperable method to link IIIF content to a location for the purposes of presentation or navigation. Uh, some use cases for this include linking a IIIF resource to a point on a map, associating a geographic bounding box to a map, geocoding a page of an atlas, or presenting aerial image surveys, for example, in a IIIF viewer. The second deliverable will develop extensions that allow the creation, storage, and presentation of georeferencing information for a scanned map image. Uh, some use cases for this include georeferencing historical maps. You might have seen some of that in Stace's section or uh, Barrett's uh, session earlier today. Uh, masking or identifying the region of a page which, con which contains a map, which is really important when you're doing uh, georeferencing. Not everything on a map image is actually a map. There could be text or other uh, uh, types of um, information on there, or there might be more than one map on a, on a single page and you want to differentiate between the two and you create a mask for those. Um, and even using IIIF maps in a geographic information system, that's definitely for the future. So after those are completed, uh, we will propose more extensions and projects through research and consultation with the IIIF maps community. Some use cases we might touch on include geospatial accessibility, discovery, aeronautical science, temporal dimensions, virtual reality, civil engineering, aerial surveys, land surveys, and archaeology. So if any of this sounds interesting to you, uh, we have Zoom meetings every other Tuesday at 11 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, Stace mentioned we alternate between community group and technical specification group meetings. And of course, everyone is welcome to both. It just depends on your area of interest. Uh, for more information, you can always consult the IIIF community calendar on their website, or you can join the MAPS Slack channel for meeting reminders and uh, just general geospatial chit chat. Uh, we also regularly make announcements on the IIIF Discuss mailing list uh, with subject lines MAPS or MAPS TSG. And if you'd like even more information about the groups and their work, uh, please take a look at our community pages on the IIIF website. You'll find more about communication channels, links to Google Drive folders containing meeting notes, charter documents, and other work material. Uh, I should also mention that this session slide deck is publicly available at the bit.ly address on the lower right corner of the screen. Uh, the link should work, and the demo videos that you'll see later on uh, will also be viewable. All right, so moving on to something a little different. Uh, this next section is a collection of eight short videos highlighting projects from the community. Uh, some of you may have seen some of these projects in a couple of the other previous sessions, uh, but not everyone. But if you're not, they're short and there's plenty of new content here. So our first uh, demo is Chronoscope presented by Matthias uh, Mulaprova. And let's get going. I don't think we have the audio, Elliot. I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop. Did, did you say something yeah. about the audio? Yeah, I don't think we have the audio. Did you do the share with computer I, audio option? I absolutely yeah. did not. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> Zoom, it's a, a mystical experience here, okay. <laughs> We'll get right just a moment. 
Okay. Okay, here we go. Let me know if you don't hear it. Welcome to Chronoscope World. The Chronoscope is a browser-based maps application to travel through space and time. Please fasten your seatbelts for a quick demo. The maps are displayed on the correct locations. You can zoom in to study the wonderful details at your own pace. The map title at the main bar is also used for home positioning the map. The bar also offers commands for search and selecting other maps. Search looks for maps that match the current viewport. So adjust the view, trigger search, and the results are displayed on the map table. The Atlas command is a collection of maps by the current cartographer, in this case by Johannes Baptist Hermanus from Nuremberg. By the way, all the map thumbnails are IIIF, like all the maps themselves in the chronoscope. Here's Russia in early 18th century, and a marvelous cartouche with a woman in red and a little angel doing its duty. But let's move on to London. And show the outlines for all the maps. Hover the label to get a preview. Okay, this one. Close the layout. Down here in the city bar, we have a collection of maps that represent the urban development of London. Oh! Currently, it's London Fashion Week in 1540. But let's have a walk at the River Thames. See all the rowing boats? And here the Globe Theatre, which has been destroyed and reconstructed meanwhile, so you can actually visit it. Talking about round things, the yellow disc is the chrono cursor. It can be dragged everywhere and it opens a context menu with additional info about the map. The permalink to the Open Glam entry at the archive or library and the chrono link can be shared on social media. Furthermore, the menu is a hub to other geo services like OpenStreetMap or Google Street View. The set depends on the current location, zoom level and on other view properties. The chronoscope provides access to nearly two and a half thousand old maps from more than 42 libraries. Therefore, it becomes pretty crowded sometimes. The outline mode offers filters to prune the amount of maps to the focus area of research. As you can see, the performance is fast enough to update the sets immediately. Time is running fast. Let's have some fun with the random rocket flights. They stimulate curiosity by teleporting the user into areas of history that you might never dreamed of. And yes, all commands have keyboard shortcuts that's time travel on steroids. Finally, ISS Tempus. That's an experimental feature to add even more joy to the party. The position of the balloon matches the current position of International Space Station, but on very old maps. To sum it up, the Chronoscope provides access to thousands of IIIF maps provided by open GLAM institutions around the globe. Geo, interaction design, high performance and quality of maps are key for a satisfying user experience. Social channels foster a community of time travelers 
who enjoy to discover the world with a chronoscope. Thanks for watching. I hope you had a pleasant stay on board. My name is Matthias Müller Prove. Enjoy your future time ride with a chronoscope. That was such a chronoscope is a really wonderful tool. I, I highly recommend you take a look at it. Okay, up next, Martin Passos will present Imagine Rio. Hello, I'm Martin Passos from Instituto Moreira Salles, and I'm here to present Imagine Rio, a platform created by humanities professors at Rice University with whom we've been collaborating under a Getty Digital Art History grant. By combining a temporally accurate geographic database created from digitized historical maps and a IIIF compliant repository of geolocated images, we offer a searchable digital atlas of Rio de Janeiro that illustrates the city's social and urban evolution as it existed and as it was imagined. Users can browse through thousands of views, maps, plans, and areas located in time and space, as well as filter and highlight layers and polygons representing buildings, public spaces, and other features taking advantage of the high resolution and rich metadata offered. This makes for a powerful research tool for anyone interested in the history of the city. On collaboration with Swiss Project Mapshot, we are using collection manifests to exchange data between the two applications and allow crowdsourcing the geolocating of our images. We also offer a narratives tool where users can leverage our published imagery and maps to make presentations about their own research. As a platform that features both iconographic and cartographic resources, we are naturally very interested in the discussions being carried by the IIIF Maps Group. Having support for geospatial data would, for instance, allow us to take a single approach for all of our content, as opposed to our current setup where maps, plans, and areas are duplicated as both IIIF images and raster tiles. And next is Peter Pradal from Clocan Technologies, who will speak about his company's projects, Old Maps Online and GeoReferencer. Hi, my name is Peter Pradal, and I work with my team on Old Maps Online, a search engine for discovering over half of a million high resolution scanned maps through the web browser, uh, where you can choose the interest uh, by selecting time range on a timeline and uh, zoom on a map and the system presents you uh, with links directly to maps, uh, scanned maps, present in uh, uh, one of the two dozens of institutions which work with us and partnered with us. Uh, on this presentation I would like to uh, speak a bit about the georeferencer.com uh, service which we uh, developed and which has a function to open any IIIF enabled um, map, scanned map, if you know the link. And it has also a function to uh, install a Chrome extension or Firefox extension in your web browser. Uh, so if you have the browser installed in your, in, your, uh, in your computer and you are visiting a website of an exhibition like this one with beautiful high resolution scanned maps uh, enabled through IIIF, the extension automatically detects the map and with one click you can bring it into the online environment of georeferencing and map layers. Uh, similarly, uh, you can, you can uh, drag and drop uh, the uh, manifest link which is present in many of the websites into this page and then uh, uh, the map is loaded including the metadata. Uh, once the map is inside of the system, uh, you are presented with the georeferencer tool uh, where you can assign with a few clicks uh, location uh, to the image. So your task is basically to find uh, the same place on a modern map and on an old map. And, uh, and once you do this for at least uh, three uh, control points, um, it, uh, it automatically suggests the additional control points uh, for, uh, for corrections. Um, you can also type the ground control points with, uh, with coordinates in numbers and uh, if you have enough of, uh, of the points uh, the map immediately uh, appears on the right location in this overlay mode 
where if you see an error, a place which should be somewhere else, like this Madagascar coast, uh, you can do perfect corrections and precisely locate the map to the right place. The tool also gives you uh, information about the precision of the coordinates, the transformation method, and allows you to clip uh, the borders uh, to remove the color uh, around the, the real map or identify place where multiple maps are stored. Uh, once you are finished with this, suddenly the image is turned into a map layer uh, and it can be compared and uh, uh, overlaid uh, with transparency with modern map or with other old maps from the old maps online system or from another systems. Uh, and you can uh, uh, present this in an uh, interface like this one, uh, where the maps are not deformed, but you see the same location on multiple documents. You can share the link uh, to the selection of the maps and the tool you have selected with your friends or embed the map in your website or uh, blog post. Um, the map uh, is also turned into a mapping service uh, for GIS users. So you get WMTS service, the mapping service, and for programmers, links to XYZ for usage in Leaflet and other mashups. Um, this is what we do for individual maps, um, but we also support gamification of this whole process. Uh, so institutions can launch on a crowdsourcing pilot uh, to ask the online visitors on their website uh, to enrich the scanned maps with the location information, enrich the metadata catalog, which they have with a special quality control on top of the crowdsourcing, and uh, enable geographical search on top of your own collection. Uh, we give you a set of widgets for visualizing the maps, also something like a small old maps online for searching directly in your collection. Uh, and these widgets can be used also in physical exhibition in your institutions or embedded in your websites. Uh, there are many institutions all over the world which work with us and the system is quite stable, so within a couple of weeks. Um, you can have your own pilot and start to enrich the scanned maps um, with the location information with these cool tools. Um, there is a, a new team behind Old Maps Online. We have uh, quite, quite a good vision for what the next version of the tool set should be. Uh, so there is a bright future. And if you drop us an email, uh, you can be part of it. Thank you very much. Okay, so this next video from Scott McAvoy at UCSD doesn't have an audio track. So I'm gonna try and provide a bit of narration to explain what's going on. Uh, this video demonstrates some future directions that the technical specification group might take and highlights a potential collaboration with the IIIF 3D community. Okay, so what you're looking at here is a 3D model of a microscopic copepod. Uh, so this is a 3D model that could be uh, presented in a IIIF viewer. Uh, and it is embedded within another 3D model, which is, um, I believe, a LiDAR scan of a patch of coral reef. So you can see how 3D models can be nested into each other. Uh, and you can go from a very small scale, so what they're kind of what he's showing here. And then you can take that and zoom outward and provide a spatial context for that coral reef and that cocoa pod uh, with the entire uh, shoreline of San Diego County. So that's a LIDAR scan of your uh, spatial data set. So you're taking a 3D model, embedding in another 3D model, and giving it um, a geospatial um, context. So this is another example where we're zooming in on a globe, also to uh, San Diego, you'll see the map layer. And then we're zooming in to the area around the University of California, San Diego campus, and another LIDAR scan of the terrain. And we're zooming right into the main library, the Theodore Geisel Library and to a 3D model of a very famous statue in the courtyard there. So this is a 3D um, element that can be uh, displayed in IIIF, but it is also embedded in this sort of larger 
um, campus model. And then from there, we can kind of take a bird's eye view, zoom into the library building itself, which is a building information management or a CAD model of the library. So the idea here is that we can take models and give them a, a location, right? And that, that's sort of the, the crux of the um, collaboration that we're thinking about. So we're just gonna pan around here in the library just a little bit. And now we're going to zoom out from that building model away from that statue and just observe the um, so the LIDAR terrain and its uh, location. So that's some really some really exciting work that we're hoping to uh, take on in the future. Um, yeah. All right. So next up is the Ed Ruscha Geocoding Project uh, presented by Adam Heath. This is the Starman Design 12 Sunsets presentation that showcases a subset, 65,000, of images from Ed Ruscha's Streets of Los Angeles archive at the Getty. Did you wonder how the images were positioned on the map? Brain Food wrote a tool to position 117,000 images that were organized with the IIIF presentation API. First, we exclude images that have no bearing on routing. Then we look for an identifiable place marker, in this case, a street address. One of the complexities with this archive was the variableness of the camera and film quality, in addition to no autofocus. For this IIIF range, we got lucky with a matching address early on. With that address, we can now drag the nearby images to the correct location and begin the process of placing additional images for proper interpolation. This project utilized IIIF collections as a grouping mechanism, IIIF image API for high-res zooming, and leaflet for both map placement and image zooming. On the back end, PostgreSQL with PostGIS was used for basic geospatial algorithms, while PG routing with the Tiger Road Edges datasets for routing. The tax property outlines are provided by the Lariac data feed. We attempted to use Huget and Structure for Motion initially, but the inbound image data was too noisy for that to work. So then we pivoted to the humanized placement of identifiable images and then interpolating the remaining canvas points. With enough images placed, a choropleth can be used to show the Lariac building coverage in the region. The range from red to green visually represents increasing coverage of the IIIF ranges. You can plainly see the Sunset Boulevard route that is showcased on the 12 Sunsets presentation project. To create the book, Every Building on the Sunset Strip, the original film rolls were cut into smaller segments and photographed. Along the way, the order of these strips got reversed, but the auto routing was able to deal with this scenario. After many ranges had been placed, we started to see a few that took a turn down the side roads. Our best guess as to why this particular route change occurred is that it was lunchtime or there was some other sort of break required by the driving team. The coral plath on the map is not just for display. Each GeoJSON outline of a Lariac building is clickable. The system immediately knows which ranges had a canvas that intersected with that building and allows us to drill back down into the matching range. Up in the hills, placement was a little hard. There was a dearth of available place marks. We ended up having to maybe find an intersection, then just looking at driveways or other breaks in the vegetation. Often there was no place marker data at all. While the 12 Sunset site shows a single route, the full scope of the archive contains many more interesting details on other locations throughout Los Angeles County. Thank you for your time. Okay, so now uh, James Taylor will present the Snapshot Project.
Hello everyone, today we are very proud to present to you Snapshot, a tool for georeferencing historical images. We would also like to give a big thanks to all of our volunteers who have been contributing to our platform. We have over 140,000 images which have been georeferenced across Switzerland, Austria and Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Georeferencing images makes it possible for us to compute its view shed. This in turn allows you to see the image footprint on the map. With Triple IF integration, Snapshot allows you to import images directly from the Triple IF server. If you move to the Discover mode, here we get to see the full power of Snapshot. These are all the images which have been currently geolocalized. You can filter by owners or collections, dates, keywords. As you move around the map, zoom in and out, the list of images below will be updated to the view of the map area. Here is another image of a glacier. One cool aspect is that from this view, if you select another image below, you will be taken to a 3D movement across the globe to where the next image is georeferenced. This gives the user a real in-depth feel of being inside a new world. If we switch to contribute mode, we can see all the images that are available for us that have yet to be georeferenced. You simply select an image, and if you so choose, select geolocalize. Here, with simple instructions on the left, we can georeference our image with at least six points. Simply selecting points on the left on the image and its corresponding point to the right on the 3D map. The user should utilize the zoom function on both the image and in the 3D map area to be more precise with its points. Once the user has selected six points, we can compute its position. Here, the user can compare the image to the 3D map to make sure he is accurate in his geolocalization. All right. So next, uh, Brian Haberberger will talk about his rerun geolocator. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian Haberberger, and I am a full stack developer at the Walter J. Ong SJ Center for Digital Humanities at St. Louis University. I'm also a IIIF Maps TSG co chair, and today I would like to talk to you about why SLU is involved with IIIF Maps. At SLU, we use annotation to drive a lot of our interfaces, and so here I'll give you an example. So, this is a leaflet viewer where, in the background, I've asked Rerum, our annotation store, for the annotations that belong to this demo. These annotations have GeoJSON bodies, so I'm able to parse the body from these annotations and hand it to the Leaflet software. Leaflet understands GeoJSON, and so it's able to draw my coordinates. For the purposes of this demo, they were all point coordinates, and that's why you see dots all across the map. So what does this look like as a real use case? And to show you that, I'll show you how I ended up with this dot on the map. So you're online, you're browsing a collection, and you come across a resource you want to work with, probably because you know some important geospatial information about it. So you grab the URI for that resource, and you come back to your software, and you say, I want to do the geospatial stuff with that resource. You provide the URI for the resource, make sure it resolves, confirm it's the right one, and then you can pick your coordinates. Like I said here, all we can do are points, so I'm going to pick a point somewhere over here in California because we got this from Stanford. So we'll say we'll use these, confirm them, and then here you see your coordinates, and here you see your target, represented overall as a web annotation. Then you would say I want to create that annotation, and now you expect that that data is a part of your data set. So when you come back to your view, you see your dot on the map. Now what you notice is I have a label and a description even though I didn't provide one when I made the web annotation. 
what we do here is pull this metadata live time from the resource. And in that way, it gives content owners a little bit of assurance that we're trying to show the most up-to-date version of their resource. The functionality you've seen here today is usually a part of a much larger software package. At SLU, we like to design unit tools, especially unit tools around annotation. Most of the software we design relies on the annotation framework. And so when we make unit tools like this, they tend to work across projects. And that's why we're involved with IIIF maps. Not only do we want these to work across projects, but we want them to work across web maps and other projects people are doing. And if we're doing this for IIIF data, we would hope if it works in our system, it would work in your system. And so we're looking for the best way to design standardized interoperable coordinate assertions on the web. And that's what we have for you today. So thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of the IIIF conference. All right, so finally, uh, Garrett-Nelson will demonstrate movie maps. So I'm gonna be opening a live web page containing an interactive Im uh, map image sitting alongside a video recording. So let's hope this works and it does. So you'll see here we have a video on top of this uh, you know, zoomable uh, uh, map viewer here. And I'm gonna stop uh, playing with that and just let the video play. I'll show you how we can narrate and explore digital collections using this tool that we built at the Leventhal Map and Education Center. Now, what you see below is a digital image of a map, and I, the curator, would be talking and saying interesting things about this, but as the viewer, you're not limited to looking at the view that I've put into the video. That's actually a live browsable map that you can pan around and explore on your own time. Now, I can also use triggers in this video recording to do things like zoom that map in, move it to a different location, highlight something else, and bring it back to its full extent. We can switch over to another map. We can zoom that one in, and we can go to another map. Now we can bring these images in using a IIIF manifest or a IIIF image endpoint. And because they're backed by IIIF, we can not only uh, work with images in the BPL system, but also from any IIIF backed repository like the David Rumsey Center, the John Carver Brown Library, or the Library of Congress. And we can do all of the same things with those objects. So that was the end of the community demo uh, portion. Uh, since this is such a long session, uh, we thought it might be a good idea to break the Q&A up into two different uh, rounds. So this is the round one of the Q&A. If you have any questions for any about any of the material you saw or any questions about the demos you just saw, um, this is your opportunity. I think I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, yeah, it seems like there's only one question. Um, some of the videos are hard to see, and will they be made available uh, separately? And yes, there's going to be a playlist sent out, right? Yes, I'll I'll post a link to the playlist, and you can all also post this uh, link to the slide deck. Those also have the videos embedded in them. I think if you if you scroll down on our listening in Whova, we've included a lot of the links actually on our session about page two. Yep. Any other questions? Doesn't look like it at the moment. Okay. Well, there'll be another opportunity for Q&A uh, at the end. So something occurs to you, just wait till then. Yes. So now I guess we can continue with the uh, technical part and uh, Brian will run through, through that section. So on to you.
should be the right screen. You see the technical overview slide? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so what I'm gonna go through is sort of the intersection of where you've seen uh, everything these projects are trying to do and sort of where that met the IIIF moment. Um, these aren't the data sets that are allowing for all the georeferencing and anything. You'll, you'll understand how new this group is by sort of seeing the pieces of technology I'm actually going to show you. So stick with me. I know some of it's not as exciting as the community is actually ready for it to be. So when we talk about meeting IIIF with some solution you're doing, uh, let's first back away from IIIF. You need to have linked open data. Uh, it has to be fully defined by context, and that's the kind of thing that um, makes it triple friendly and allows you to have a shot at extending the triple IF API. So right here, you'll see a few of those technologies that I've listed. So to make it linked data, you can follow the linked data specification, LD 1.1 on the web. For doing geo stuff, there's the GeoJSON specification, which has a GeoJSON linked data context already created for it. And then to allow for structuring and connecting to your resources and fragments of resources, you have the web annotation framework. So I will pop out and just real fast show you what I mean. So here's the JSON LD 1.01. I'm not going to sit here and read it for you. You can find out about it for yourself. Um, so there's one in 1.1. Here's where what the GeoJSON specification looks like. It'll come through and tell you about like all your shapes you want to do. Uh, here's GeoJSON LG, LD, which gives a linked data context for those terms. And then here's um, web annotation that tells you about bodies and targets and, and how you might connect those things. Um, so those are sort of the, the, the lowest common denominator pieces uh, that we had to start using to sort of try to proof the idea. And we did. Uh, so here's a simple web annotation you'll see in the context that's just the web annotation in GeoJSON. We haven't gotten to IIIF yet, but this was processed correctly in the linked data playground. And so proving that was possible to form any sort of standardized uh, geospatial assertion was a massive first step. Uh, something I want to impress upon you and that you probably recognize from today is that there is just a lot of active research in trying to figure out how to do these things. Sticking GeoJSON in a web annotation wasn't just like, oh, hey, great idea, Brian. Like, no, I, I knew to do that because I did a lot of research with a lot of these communities, went to other conferences, and tried to pick out what the lowest common denominators were. And I found in a lot of places that meant GeoJSON, probably in some kind of web annotation at a best attempt effort to have a context for it that didn't always work out. Um, and that's sort of the general state of maps on the web right now. And I think you probably noticed that today from all the different um, demos you've seen, how they're all doing particularly similar things and surprisingly unnaturally like encoded the same way things in the background, uh, but everybody's got a little twist. So the definition I use for my ground control points is different. I encode my ground control points different, that kind of thing. Uh, something like the chronoscope, which you've seen uh, support many different types of formats has already come across this because you saw all the different formats and all the different ways he could show you those maps. We're just now sort of approaching that sort of status of things. So what, Presentation three is, is linked data 1.1 plus web annotation plus the presentation three spec. So what you'll notice is that gave me all of the same common denominator uh, background technologies to try to make this assertion, but for triple IF stuff. Uh, of course, we found success because we did the background research beforehand. And from that, we were able to generate the first recipe for our group, which looks like this. And we'll actually come back to that in a second to do a lot of work for, for me. Uh, so here you see all I really did was swap out web annotation for presentation three. And then you'll see here in the properties, the label is encoded as a language map, which is what you need to do with presentation three. It can't just be like a simple screen. I need to show that work. So after some time of review and working with the Triple F Maps community, we decided to form the, te the technical specification group. Uh, this was because ample use cases and implementation existed to show triple IF resources in geospatial situations. Uh, so what that meant was, okay, we proved it, we can do it through web annotation, but now what's a more inclusive way in presentation API to make it uh, like primary data? Uh, and to do that inside of triple IF, to have a property on top on triple IF resource types, you have to define an extension for that. 
uh, the IIIF Maps group is working on that extension. Whoop. And I will just show you to show you I'm not a liar. Uh, here. It's here. It's out. It's for the public. Uh, I believe we'll share this link with you. You could always come and read it if you want. It's kind of interesting because you'll come across some things like, oh, do we call things members or properties or fields? You know, the kind of typical random technical stuff you come across. Uh, I will say vocabulary and ontology make a huge difference. And I'll talk a little more about that sort of as we as we get to it. So that's just kind of like an overview. So now I'm going to dig down into each of those points uh, to probably show you some code, show you some brackets. So eh, stick with me. I know that can be daunting. So I want to start with linked data. Something really interesting about the GeoJSON LD context is that when it was created, it was created to work with JSON LD 1.0. If you do your research into linked data 1.0, you find that it has a really damning property where it can't process lists of lists. Uh, so when linked data comes across something it can't process, it's supposed to ignore it. That's an important little distinction to know. So to explain to you what a list of a list is, it's, it's a particular data structure where you have a list, in this case it's an array, or my first item is a string, but now my second item is another array with two strings inside of that. So here you see a list within a list. Uh, and to show you that you cannot process lists of lists, like I said, if you do your research, come back here to 1.0, I'll type that fancy phrase, list of lists, you'll see a note just straight out in the specification saying lists of lists are not allowed in this version of JSON LD. This decision was made because it's complex. And of course, yes, that is complex. So that left us kind of in a bad space because if we wanted to pull in and use the GeoJSON LD context, I needed a way to make sure we weren't doing it with linked data 1.0. So why is that like the big, the big kind of issue? Well, for many of you, if you've worked with GeoJSON, you'll recognize what it looks like to make a polygon in GeoJSON. So here's just a simple rectangle, but you'll notice right away this has a list of list structure because each uh, coordinate point. Each point on the rectangle is a pair of coordinates, and the rectangle itself is a collection of four coordinate pairings. So you end up with a list of lists. And that's super bad. I took this to the JSON only 1.0 playground inside of one of my web annotations, and it spat me back an empty object and an error. Uh, so that's not good. I would assume that most people need to be able to do polygons. I don't think I would be uh, contested with that statement. <laughs> So must use linked data 1.1. This is a, a restriction and an implementation note you need to know about. Um, here is when I went to the 1.1 playground with that same web annotation, you'll see here list of list. It came out right. I didn't get an empty object. I got my coordinates back and that, that's what I needed. Uh, why that worked is probably a deeper conversation than for here. But all you need to know is the 1.1 specification says they are fully supported. So. That's all you need to know about why they work. <laughs> it's just a fun little thing you need to learn about. And like I said, a lot of research going into this. And that was one of those, you know, when I hit that wall, it was, oh gosh, what are we going to do? So I'll tell you what actually saved me. And it saved me for free, which is unheard of. Like I said, a lot of unnatural things happened in this research. You must use Presentation API 3. So first, I just played with Presentation API 2, trying to see if I could make the assertion at all. It was not possible. Uh, I ran into term collisions with simple things like label that resolving, you know, oh, okay, well, I could just make the label an array. Well, no, in presentation two, you're not supposed to do that. You have to break the schema if you're gonna do that. So that's a no-go. We can't, we can't be having that and endorse it. Uh, so I sort of came out and said, you just can't do this in presentation API two. You need to be using presentation API three. Now, why was I saved by presentation API three for free? If you look at the top, Presentation 3 API's uh, linked data context file, you'll see this little at version 1.1 tag. What that does is tell processors that you must process this as JSON LD 1.1. And not only that, the way you scope in and include other people's contexts and the way that's viewed overall, that will always take the most up to date version tag. So if this second context on the right had a 1.0 in it, and this one on the left had a 1.1 in it, and I included them both, it would default to 1.1. So like I said, I just kind of got lucky and got saved for free. Since I'm trying to extend the presentation API, when I include GeoJSON stuff with it, it gets processed as 
bam. So all of that led to let's do a recipe. So we have a way to do this. We, we found a way in web annotation to do it. We know it's linked open, use, linked open usable data friendly. We know it can work with triple IF. What's that actually going to look like when we put it in with presentation API 3? What are the things we're going to run into? We'll talk, I think, uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow, there's a couple of talks about the cookbook that I'll be in, and we'll go more in depth about what a recipe is there. But here, I'll just show you the map, the important stuff. Uh, so it just said, hey, there's a use case where you have this image of a map or maps, and you want to relate that to real world positioning. So you take this little fragment out of the map, and you want to encode it in such a way that you can get it to show up in a leaflet or something like this. Here's the area I've outlined, and I mean that that is this representation of the fragment of the resource. And in a lot of the georeferencing software, they make this a lot more apparent. I just don't have those same data layers to do that. I'm, I'm sticking to very basics here. Um, and so this is what a full 2D, let's just stick it on there. That's what it looks like to do it. Um, there are fun implementation notes. So I'll tell you something about the linked data context and how to, how to handle that, how to read GeoJSON, uh, what to do when you're having multiple contexts and where the IIIF context belong. Uh, a note about GeoJSON properties that if there's time today, I'll give you a spiel about, but I won't right now. Um, and of course, that we, you, know, you can do more than just a polygon. There's points and all kinds of things you can do. Uh, you note the, we note the restriction, don't do LD 1.0. And then I say, here's an example. It's got a canvas with an image. The image is a map. I want a piece of that map, and I want it to show up on a web map. Um, so you go through the recipe. So this is what that data object actually looks like. Um, your classic manifest here you see at the top where I included the GeoJSON and then that's the image you got your canvas and then the fun part here's the actual annotation that supplies the polygon and the coordinates so remember that little label right there and that it's going to be a square and that that was my target so what do you expect that to look like when you go into uh, an interface which I might be jumping ahead I might not be ready to say that yet yeah, I'll show you what that looks like in an interface in a second. So I've shown you how we got there, how we got to, uh, through the background technologies, knew we could make assertions that IIIF Presentation 3 could support. Um, so here's just calling out those pieces. Again, at the top, you've got your context, you've got a label that is a language map, and you've got your list of lists representation of coordinates. And then when you take that into the playground and make sure it all works, it renders out. There's my coordinates. Uh, the list of lists of lists of lists of lists, it's all there. Uh, polygon, feature, geometry, all of those were defined correctly, and it picked out the right representation of the label. Um, for example, web annotation says do a label this way, and in IIIF presentation API 3, they say we're actually going to overwrite that and do it as a language map. So it's important that this actually recognized it as a language map. This means I am processing IIIF vocabulary. So GeoJSON vocabulary, IIIF vocabulary, no errors. That's what we want. So that meant we were ready to do an extension. Uh, we wanted to do an extension because we don't want you to have to rely on web annotation. We want you just to be able to use IIIF stuff. Um, so we thought it's appropriate that IIIF resource types actually have a property field member of their own to store GeoJSON. So we imagine this thing called NavPlace, and I actually relate it to NavDate, which is why I have this uh, definition here. I'm just going to read it. It's a set of one or more geographic points. So not just one, you can have multiple that clients may use for navigation purposes when presenting the resource to the user in a world map based user interface. So I have a resource. I know it's in the world. So I need to have a visual of the world to say it's there. Um, these things like leaflet, Google Maps, open layers, stuff like chronoscope, uh, all those things. I should be able to supply them GeoJSON, and I'd bet you they would draw them. And I bet you if you ask those people today, hey, if I handed you NavPlace with GeoJSON in it, would you be able to draw it? And they would say, yeah, just give me a day to make my parser grab it. And that's what we want. Um, so here's an example of it. This is just the property right here. The value is going to be a feature collection, whether you have one or multiple um, features. Um, it was just sort of a, that's a best practice decision to say, hey, let's just always have a feature collection there. That way we don't have to worry about different types of what we might have to process. It'll just be features in a feature collection. Um, and here's my point. This is where the metadata goes. Yeah, 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 fun stuff. So here's what it looks like on a canvas. It's just that same property I just showed you, just how it might relate on a whole canvas, right? So you see here, I don't have to go to the canvas annotation properties. 
I just look for Nav Place on the canvas. It's different. Same but different. So Nav Place in the cookbook. So here are a couple previews. These are for demonstration purposes only. I'm not finished with them yet, but I'm going to go ahead and show them anyway. Um, I'll go to the basic one. Oh, how am I meant to open my other set of tabs? It's fine. Uh, represent a manifest on a web map with the Nav Place extension. Uh, so same sort of thing with the recipe. It has a lot of the same rhetoric. This looks pretty much exactly the same. So I don't have to go through that with you. I just want to let you know it's there and I've started it. Uh, Nav Place isn't published yet. So before I can get these into the cookbook, I actually have to finish that draft. So, you know, things are happening in reverse order a little bit here, but eh, this is how research works. I'm not mad about it. So here's another one, same simple idea, but this one, I just wanted to impress upon people, uh, you can have multiple features. So there's two features here, which should both be highlighted if I did it right. Yes. So two canvases, each with their own feature. And then there's another recipe I imagine that's one resource with multiple features. Um, this is, like I said, we're still thinking about it. I have some to do's to do. So what might you expect that to look like on? interface so this is why i asked the web map question if you were around in the, in the other sessions why i asked about web maps how would you expect nav place to look so here you'll see i come to a piece of software using the content state api supported parameters i believe that's correct uh, and i actually hand in the manifest from that preview recipe i just showed you and if you remember what it was about you'll notice i've got the label and the description, which happens to be the uh, address in this little pop-up here. So all I did was parse nav place out of this manifest and hand it to Leaflet. It was a tiny little bit of script, and that's all I had to do to get it to show up. Same thing for that one that had two canvases. I'm able to grab both the canvases and draw the shape for it. Uh, not only that, I can do the same thing if I just come in with an annotation list. So here you'll see I switched because this is not a triple IF object, this is just an annotation list. And I can parse that for the annotation or annotations in it and draw those. And likewise, I could come in and just hand it an annotation. So if you just get an annotation collection together, you can have your dots on a map in no time. Uh, that's one of the fun things to realize and a real fun you know, unit tool idea to design around. Um, again, this is just for flat 2D, I'm putting it on a map sort of things. This is as far as I've gotten. So I don't have any cool like georeferencing view to show you. Uh, but that gives you an idea sort of of the state and where we're at with this stuff. And hopefully that gives you an idea of what we're trying to do with the cookbook, which we'll talk about tomorrow. So what might the next steps be? Uh, so from today and from all the research we've seen, and I think almost anyone would agree with me when I say this, there's an immediate need for a unified ontology, or you might know them as predicates or vocabulary. Um, it's real easy for us to do that with the things like rectangle and polygon, right? We all pretty much agree what that is, unless we're using different coordinate systems that's not WGS84, which you're gonna have to go to a different kind of mapping system to use a different coordinate system. We're not there yet. Um, things like MapML Online, for example, are already allowing you to switch out coordinate systems and base maps and all those things. Um, so of course we look to adjacent communities for, for direction in some of those situations because people are further along than we are. Um, so the Triple F Maps community group has a glossary that they've started where they started doing this for me. Uh, it's important because when I write something like a recipe, if I want to use the word geolocation, I better, I better be using it in the right context. And so people like me, I don't actually work, work with maps, right? I'm more about the data online. And so to me, it's just a very interesting challenge to standardize coordinate data, and that's what I'm focusing on. Um, but I have to be careful when I come into conferences like this to use words even like georeferencing and geolocating. I'm surprised how, how much we've used that today and we've gotten away with it so far, so that's kind of fun. Uh, not only that, you have to think about how are we gonna view these things in the future? How do you view IIIF data right now? You go to M3, Mirador 3, you go to UV, you go to any of the number of IIIF viewers you know about, but none of them are gonna be able to draw those dots for you. Web maps are the things that draw those dots for you, uh, especially for the data that's focused to be online. You could even come in your ArcGIS system and get GeoJSON out of it to then go show it online. You saw a pipeline earlier where you've got KMLs and XMLs and 
plain tab delimited text that you then shim into this or that, G GeoJSON for this, KML for that. Uh, it's, it's a madhouse out there. Um, but a, a common denominator I have found is that at some point in most of those shimming pop pipelines to get to a view, GeoJSON is involved. And that's sort of why we pick GeoJSON as the encoding to put alongside of the uh, IIIF resources. It wasn't a willy-nilly decision. I just found that that was a factual lowest common denominator, whether people knew it or not. It's just a funny thing. So the future, it's a little bit past next steps. Uh, as I've been saying, there are many in the community whose needs already supersede this progress you've seen here. Uh, you can tell by all the geo referencers around. They were, you know, they're, they're working with me, trying to get to these extensions, get the stuff out the door. And this is our sort of getting the feet wet with these 2D relational things uh, to open the way for that 3D and geo referencing and multiple layers kinds of stuff. Um, especially around ground control points, we need to get that ontology figured out. If you're going to have ground control points in your manifest, I need to know exactly how those are encoded so that I can do the same thing and we can pass our resources back and forth. Um, so uh, we sort of look to the community to know, to know what needs supported next. The reason georeferencing is already an immediate deliverable is because those were the people showing up to the calls and who were active and who show up to talk with me about, oh, I see how you're doing it here. Here's how I'm doing it in my system. You know, I looked at all of these people's data sets when they were coming in. I asked, what does your data look like? And everybody sent me a snippet. And it's, it's pretty cool because you're all just so, so close. You're so close, but no one's got the, the endorsed. This is the way we're going to do it, guys. Um, so where we're going will depend on where the community wants to go. If all of a sudden haptic sleeve accessibility features to navigate geospatially are what's, what's immediately needed next, that's what we'll work on. Um, so there's a lot of research and a lot of decisions actively being made. Uh, it's a very supportive community. It's a community that wants to see this stuff done. You don't get held back. You get pushed up. People just push you and go, hey, 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 let's do this. Let's do this. I support you. Um, it's really fun to be involved in. And if this is something you're interested in, this is a good time to start joining these communities. And that's, uh, that's all I have for you. Did I do okay? My overtime? My undertime? doing okay perfect time okay thank you yes yeah thank you um we are we're doing very good in time i don't see any new questions um but there's time if we want to wait or if somebody wants to speak up and if anyone who gave a presentation earlier has something to react about what i said especially if I spoke for you, <laughs> feel free. Um, while we're waiting, uh, in the chat for the session, I posted two links, uh, one a link to the slide deck and one uh, to a YouTube playlist with all the demos. So you can watch them in the comfort of your own living room. And hopefully those documents like the LinkedIn and nav place and those recipes, those are all fair game to look at too. If you just want to see some of the yeah, research. Yeah, they should all be open. Made. Mm -hmm. So one legitimate question I have, if I can ask myself of it, maybe this group of people that are here, when you're online doing your online data stuff, how do you interact with web maps? It, are most of you shimming your files into GeoJSON to get it to show up on a web map, for example, online? Or are you storing it as GeoJSON outright already? Or is GeoJSON just one of those, oh, I better have it that way just because? I don't know if anyone wants to type or raise their hand. But that's a that's a research question I'm still looking for. I, I want to know that what is common denominator commonalities? How are you interacting with web maps? How are you getting your data online as your dots and your shapes and all those things? Yeah, I'd say uh, GeoJSON is pretty pretty standard for that. Right? Yeah. 
strange, unnatural thing. It's just every single person. <laughs> At some point, there's GeoJSON in there. I know it. <laughs> um, you know, I think another common way, and, and someone can tell me this is wrong, but, uh, you know, using these services like we were talking about earlier, uh, like web map service or tab map service or web feature service. So you can upload your data in whatever format it's in originally to some kind of um, geospatial server and then add those as layers onto your, onto your web map. And I think that is why that's such an important research direction, right? Is to figure out how we can interoperate with some of these more established geospatial standards. And that also allows you to bring AAAF content into systems that aren't um, uh, that don't normally handle that kind of content, like we were saying, like a GIS. Yeah. Just coming in hot here. Um, this was a link I shared earlier. It's worth going out and looking at. Uh, like we had brought up W3C OGC groups and their APIs. Um, I had brought up MapML before. Uh, something super fun about this view, I'm doing this now because I love to brag about this, is that I didn't require any extra stripping, uh, scripting to do this in another different, in a different kind of serialization. So instead of GeoJSON objects, these are MapML objects. And what MapML is, is HTML for the web. So what's on there is no script, it's all a map web component. And I've serialized features as, um, they just look like divs essentially and stuck them inside of the map ML and they drew. So when I got the GeoJSON, I just said, ah, switch that to map ML and then fed it into their map. Boom, instant worked. Um, it's a very flexible system to work in. Pretty sure I even get the metadata. Do I get the metadata? Yeah, I get the metadata. Uh, Brian, do you want to talk about or is there anything to talk about with your uh, interactions with some of these um, other groups? Like, um... yeah. I I could go on. I could go on for days. Or just um, just to mention them, like who who you're who you're working with, and yes. Uh, so in particular, this is uh, uh, the uh, MapML proposal and the MapML specification out of uh, Canada. It's the something Canada resources, Natural the, Resources Canada. Bam. Right. It's a W three C. Yes, or an OGC. It's an OGC. Yeah, oh, yeah, you're right. It's W three C. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. So yeah, W3C and OGC, uh, those are the people I've had the most like kind of gone and crossed over. I'm a member with OGC through my institution. So I get to go to like member meetings, which is super cool. Um, if you are interested in things like accessibility features, they uh, are very much focused on that right now. And something super, super cool that I would love to see some of the georeferencing stuff pick up is they have an indoor ML specification for doing georeference stuff, but inside, inside buildings, it's super cool. It's interesting. And that yeah, kind of ties in with that um, the demo I was trying to narrate uh, over right where you could kind of go from outside to inside, right? And kind of change your perspective about location. Yes. And then they even have collections of just like, here's what we think are the, so of course, this is where I went for my research and research things like this. And, you know, the base of all those best practices is GeoJSON. And I'm like, all right, I know it. These were all good. It's all good stuff to look at. Anyway. Stop taking over the screen. Uh, Matthias mentioned in the chat that uh, uh, metadata, GeoJSON metadata is available in the chrono, Chronoscope application. Um, it's pretty cool. There's a link there. And these are all the UNESCO heritage sites. And if you hover over them or click them, uh, a, a photo of the site uh, shows up, which is really neat. And there are a lot of them. Any other questions or anything you want to chat about? Well, if not, I think we could just end our session early and say goodbye. Yeah, sure. I, I will let you know, we are looking at accessibility. We are looking at discoverability. Yeah. We have use cases out there for how do I make spatial or non-spatial queries? How do I draw that box on a map and get all my resources that are there? that kind of thing. Um, yes. That's also come up in the group in a, in a, in a, in a, 
and are sort of nearer to being worked on than other things. Great. Well, it sounds like maybe we'll wrap it there. Um, the, the last thing I'll add, sorry, just from a really high level is that, um, you know, the questions can kind of continue with the, the community group and the MAPS TSG group. So hopefully this is um, kind of introduced that process to a bunch of folks here. But um, yeah, unless there's uh, last questions in the Q&A um, from anybody here, um, yeah, I'll say thanks to the MAPS chairs, Virginia, Elliot, uh, Brian, um, Barrett, Mike, uh, and all the folks who recorded videos today. Um, great stuff. So anything else uh, the, the facilitators here want to add? No, nope, thanks for coming. Yep. All right. Thank thanks everybody for, for, for coming. Yeah, I'll end the recording here and we'll see you uh, at future sessions. Okay. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night.